It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning, Mr. Speaker. Last week, the Integrity Commissioner revealed that his investigation into the removal of lands from the Greenbelt had entered a new phase. His office is now preparing summonses and uh, for nu numerous witnesses uh, to be interviewed. We all remember how the Premier and the former Solicitor General both refused to, to um, appear before the Emergencies Act inquiry. They refused a summons to testify. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Will he require all government officials, including ministers, to cooperate in full when they are summoned by the Integrity Commissioner? Much, Mr. Speaker, I think the Premier has been uh, very clear on that. He continues to work with uh, uh, the Integrity Commissioner, Mr. Speaker. But uh, let's get really to what uh, the Leader of the Opposition is saying. Right? Uh, the NDP, of course, do not want us to continue to build housing for the people of the province of Ontario. Yep. Because for the NDP, what they would rather is that the, uh, uh, the rich are less rich as long as the poor are poor. Right? That's what the NDP is all about. Now, let me tell you what new housing means for the people of Stouffville. For the people of Stouffville, the new housing that the minister introduced means that we are building homes in a community that has the infrastructure to do it, a community that has schools, a community that has churches right by it, a community that has two brand new GO train stations, a community that has community centre right next to a downtown core that is desperate for people to fill the jobs in our service industries and right close to farms that are so desperate for people to work on the land and that's why we bring in temporary foreign workers, Mr. Speaker. It is a growing community that wants new housing, and it is a, a, a group of people who are coming to this country who demand it, Mr. Speaker. We need them, and we will be there for them. The supplementary question. Speaker, we're going to keep talking about integrity, because the people of this province, they deserve a government they can trust and that they can believe in. Last week, last week, this government appointed a Conservative Party donor, Madeleine Bodenstein, to the York Region Police Services Board. This comes a year after the government appointed another Conservative Party do donor, Mario Cordellucci, to the same board. And, Speaker, not only are they both Conservative Party donors, they are also both personal friends of this Premier and even sat at the same table with the Premier at his daughter's wedding reception last year. These appointments earn $10,000 a year. So my question is to the Premier, why is the Premier stacking the York Region Police Services Board with his personal friends and donors? Mr. Speaker, what we're doing is ensuring that the York Region Police Service Board has qualified people who have made an impact on their community to work okay. with the York Region Police, Mr. Speaker. Now, we have a growing community, and that means that as, as our community grows, we want to make sure that whether it's the police service boards or the other agencies that support the growth that we're seeing in York Region, that they have the highest quality people to do so. Now, the committee can review all appointments, but Mr. Speaker, let's, let's really talk about what the issue is for the NDP. The issue for the NDP is, is that they do not want want to see an Ontario economy that is continuing to grow. It drives them crazy, Mr. Speaker, that we are seeing jobs come back to the province of Ontario. We've seen what the NDP want, right? We've seen the show before, right? They want to kill jobs. They want to kill employment. They want to over-regulate the economy. And we saw what happened when they had the opportunity Response. to do so in cooperation with the Liberals. They killed manufacturing. They drove away jobs. What are we doing? We're bringing thousands of jobs and opportunity back to Ontario. The final supplementary. Let me tell you what matters to us over here on this side, Speaker. Transparency, integrity, accountability, and that's what matters to the people of this province, too. And let me tell you that to earn the trust of the people, a premier should avoid even the appearance of a conflict of interest. Yet this premier keeps appointing his friends and his donors to public boards. His friends and do donors seem to have a curiously timed information. It even looks like he's giving his friends and his donors special treatment at the expense of everyone else. Speaker, does anyone on that side of the legislature care how bad this looks to the average Ontarian? Mr. Mr. Speaker, what the average Ontario wants is a government that will focus on building an economy, Mr. Speaker. And that is exactly what we're doing. When you look across government as a whole, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, in cooperation with the Minister of Red Tape Reduction, they took off over $7 billion of taxes and regulation. 
that they, along with the Liberals, put on Ontario job creators, driving away thousands of jobs, Mr. Hundreds. Speaker. In fact, Hundreds. together, they decided that Ontario needed to move away from manufacturing and focus on the service industry only. What are we doing? What are we doing for the people of the province of Ontario? We're cutting taxes. We're bringing back a climate where jobs are coming back. There are so many jobs in the province of Ontario, we can't fill them all, so we need people to come and help us build, like countless generations have done before, and we're going to make sure they have housing, transit, transportation, and the best schools, despite the fact that they vote against all. Thank you. The next question, Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I'd like to go back to the Premier. Residents of Alliston in the riding of Simcoe Gray were shocked to hear that 12 nurses at the Stevenson Memorial Hospital were being laid off at the end of March. 12 nurses at a critical regional hospital that serves more than 40,000 Ontarians a year. Now people in Simcoe Gray are going to have to wait even longer for care. Speaker, why is this government laying off nurses when highway health care is at an all-time high under their watch? Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. I'm not sure if the member opposite is second-guessing the work of the hospital CEO, the public board at Stevenson Memorial. I can tell you that as a government, Premier Ford and I have had the opportunity with the member from Simcoe Gray, Gray's advocacy to actually visit Stevenson Memorial. And because of that uh, important important facility that serves the people of Alliston and the surrounding area in Simcoe Gray, we've actually announced a redevelopment project for that community hospital. For the member opposite to suggest that she knows better what is happening at Stevenson Memorial, more so than the management team, the president and CEO speaks volumes about what she understands about the public health system. Supplementary question, Leader of the Opposition. I'll tell you what I do know, Speaker. I know that there is something deeply wrong if a hospital is laying off nurses in the middle of a staffing crisis and an emergency room crisis in this province. And I have some numbers that I'd like to share with the Minister of Health. Average ER wait times for admission right now across this province, 22.9 hours. That's nearly a full day waiting for a bed. Ontarians without a family doctor, 2.2 million. 2.2 million without a family doctor. The number of kids on a wait list for surgery right now, 12,000. But most importantly, Speaker, behind each of those numbers are real people real people that this government is choosing not to help. And so my question, Speaker, is to the Premier. Will you stop getting in the way between Ontarians and the health care that they need? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. I have some numbers I would like to share with the member opposite and the people of Ontario. You know, since the beginning of the pandemic, we have been able to, as a result of working with hospital partners, not fighting them and second-guessing them, 3,500 additional hospital beds here, in the here. province of Ontario in less than three years. That is an incredible achievement. We work with our hospital partners. We do not second-guess the decisions that they make at the local level. Again, I will say Stevenson Memorial in particular, incredible hospital, doing incredible work with incredible staff. And because of that work, we Order. are doing an inve a investment of a redevelopment project because of the leadership of Premier Ford, because of the leadership from the member from Simcoe Gray. We will continue Fox. to do that regardless of what the NDP wants to do. The final supplementary. Speaker, if their plan is so good, why are things getting worse in this province? Why are they getting worse? Five years in, this government is fighting nurses in court to keep their wages down. That's why we can't keep nurses on the job. That's why we can't retain them. And I am worried about what I'm seeing, and I think Ontarians across this province are worried. Their plan to privatize health care is taking Ontario in the wrong direction. It's taking us toward a two-tier system, where a select number of people with deep pockets or cozy connections to this government can jump to the front of the line, where even routine surgeries are going to cost the system more in private clinic fees where people are going to be waiting even longer for care, if they can get it at all. And in fact, Speaker, it's already happening. And so my question to the Premier again is, 
When will you reverse course Question. and stop putting private profits ahead of patient care? Minister of Health. Speaker, this is precisely the problem with the member opposite and her party that she leads. Ideologically opposed to not looking at innovation, not looking at new ideas. Order. You know, Bill 60 actually involves and ensures that we can expand community surgical and diagnostic, of which I might add there are over Order. 800 in the province today that have been licensed under both NDP and Liberal governments. Take off the blinders and look at the opportunities that we have when we open up and ensure Order. that people have access in their community faster so that we don't have the backlog, so that we ensure the people who are waiting for surgeries can get it quickly in community. Isn't that at the core what we all want as politicians? Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, it's come to my attention that cancer patients waiting for surgery right now at the Ottawa Hospital are being bumped by clients of the for-profit clinic that's been operating on Saturdays at the Riverside campus okay. of the Ottawa Hospital. This for-profit clinic has been offering nurses double the wages they earn in our public hospital system, and that has had an impact on our public system's ability to have the staff capacity ready for cancer surgery for patients in urgent need. This is what I'm being told privately by hospital staff who fear the repercussions for speaking publicly. Speaker, a very simple question to the Premier. Will they commit today to investigate this matter? Mr. Pell. You know, Speaker, it is very challenging for me to answer the member opposite's question when he is the same individual who has been organizing and participating in rallies in front of surgical centers in his own community. It is shameful. Order. It is frustrating. It is unbelievable that a member of our legislature thinks that it is appropriate for him to actually protest in front of where people are getting surgeries Order. that they need Order. in community. Now, I, I, uh, I have to question where the member's values are when he thinks that protesting patients Opposition who are getting critical surgery in his own community is doing the right thing. Order. A supplementary question. Speaker, I'm not going to respond to the disinformation campaign of this government about. I'm going to ask the member to withdraw his impermanence and ask the government side to come to order. Ask the government side to come to order. The member will withdraw. Thank you, Speaker. I'm not going to respond to the smear campaign of this government. I, I have not heard the member say he withdraws the unparliamentary comment. Ask the member to withdraw his unparliamentary comment. Speaker, look, as this government engages in theatrics, I can't hear the member for Ottawa Centre when there's interjections from this side of the House. The member will withdraw. He did. Thank you, Speaker. Look, there is a serious question being posed here, and I would expect a serious answer from the minister opposite. Every day a cancer patient waits for surgery is another day that patient risks losing their life. It's another day that family is put in stress and anxiety because that patient could lose their life. Bill 60, the legislation that this government's putting forward, allowing for for-profit, investor-driven clinics in our for-profit system, has led to a secretive question. clinic in our city that may be putting lives at risk in Ottawa. Speaker, it's a very simple question. Will the government investigate these allegations made apparent to me? It's their responsibility. Will you do it? Order. Minister of Health, reply. You know, if the member opposite would actually look closely at what Bill 60 is going to be able to do in the past, is expand those surgical opportunities, ensuring that individuals who are waiting for life-saving surgeries do not have to languish on wait lists. You know, we have an opportunity here with Bill 60, if passed, that not-for-profit, for-profit, community-based hospital partnerships are going to be able to form so that individuals who have been waiting 
on wait lists, who are calling every one of our constituency offices saying, can I get my surgery faster? <laughs> they now have that opportunity if and when Bill 60 is passed, because we have a process that will ensure individuals who want to have these surgical and diagnostic uh, surgeries in community will have a pathway and a complete understanding of how they can do that. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member from Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Infrastructure. The growing and diverse communities in Mississauga, Etobicoke are counting on our government to build transit, schools, hospitals, roads to support their economic growth and to make their lives easier. The previous Liberal government failed to prioritize projects that would make life better, more productive and more convenient for the community across our provinces. That is why our government must show immediate action to make the strategic investments needed in infrastructure in order to rebuild our economy. The people of my riding of Mississauga Lakeshore and the surrounding community deserve access to the services they need now. Speaker, can the minister please describe how our government is building key infrastructure projects that will improve the lives of the people of this province of Ontario? Thank you. Minister of Infrastructure to respond. Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Mississauga member for the question. Our government's plan to build Ontario is one of the most ambitious in the province's history, with planned investments of $159 billion over 10 years and $20 billion in years 2022-23 alone. Last week in Mississauga, Infrastructure Ontario and Trillium Health Partners have selected their builder to build the Mississauga Hospital, Here. now named the Peter Gilgen Hospital. Together, the three parties will work in a cooperative and collaborative manner over the next 12 to 18 months to determine schedule, design, price, and risk. Mr. Speaker, this will be the largest hospital in Canada with the largest emergency room in Ontario, 950 beds and nine new, operating room, nine new operating rooms to address the growing community. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the minister for her response. It is encouraging that under the leadership of this premier and this minister, robust investments in infrastructure continues to be a priority as Ontario's population grows. Under the previous Liberal government, a lack of infrastructure investment meant that hospitals became overcrowded and outdated, schools closed, and transit was being built at a snail's pace. Communities across our province are awaiting complete com completion of projects that will support our government's vision of building a stronger Ontario. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is putting shovels in the ground to build the projects that are needed most for communities across this province? Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Our government is building a stronger Ontario. In our most recent market update, it included 38 large-scale complex infrastructure projects totaling more than $35 billion. Mr. Speaker, and that's transit, highways, hospitals, long-term care, and schools. In the West End of Toronto and Peel Region, Mr. Speaker, our government is investing in expanding the Queensway Health Care Centre. We are building two new long-term care homes through a rapid delivery program which will bring activate 600 beds we are investing in the cancer care center in Brampton and we are building a brand new hospital in Brampton with 250 patient beds and a 24-hour emergency care center mr. speaker but we're not just investing in growing areas we are investing in health care facilities right Spons. across the province the next question the member for Toronto Danforth Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is the Premier. The climate crisis is already driving up the price of food, it's causing power outages, and it's forcing people out of their homes. Yesterday, the United Nations Panel on Climate Change pleaded for aggressive climate action from governments around the world to deal with the crisis we're facing. What we have is a government whose plan is a complete failure. It will not do what is needed. It will not meet the United Nations standard. When will the Premier cut emissions by the amount necessary to protect the people of Ontario? 
Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member opposite for that question. Um, this report uh, rightly highlights uh, the need uh, to do more, Speaker, and that's why uh, the Premier is doing just that. Ho Sung Lee, the chair of the UN panel, spoke about low carbon electrification and investing in those projects. That's why Premier Ford is working with Algoma and DeFasco to electrify the Arc Furnace. That's supporting jobs, Mr. Speaker. And it's taking two million cars off the road. That's why, Speaker, uh, in this report, they called for investments in public transit. There is no government in this province's history that has invested more in public transit than Premier Ford and this government. <laughs> Speaker, we're going to continue to make the investments we need to provide clean jobs for the next generation. For the immigrant looking to come to this Response. province, we'll have a home for them and a clean job for generations to come. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Speaker, the problem that we have is that we need to cut emissions dramatically by 2030, and this government's plan is not on track to do that. If you look at their own numbers, the IASO says that the increased emissions from the gas plants in this province will wipe out the savings from the electrification of steel plants, will wipe out the savings from electrified vehicles until 2030. If you look at this government's plan, it does not actually deliver what we need to have delivered. The transit projects he talks about are, for the most part, going to be completed by 2030. The cuts have to happen now, now. When will he take the action we need? To reply, Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, there Order. you saw what the NDP's plan is. Yell till you're red in the face and hope decarbonization happens. Their plan— Order. Speaker, it's about contrasting plans. Their plan, and they should be clear, is about punishing Ontarians with record high taxation. What this Premier and this government have showed, when you create a competitive climate, you attract clean investment. You create jobs. And guess what, Speaker? We're generating more revenue as a government as a result. Speaker, their plan is about no and taxes. We saw it when they objected to trees of no significance on the Ontario line that will take 28,000 cars off the road every day. <laughs> Speaker, we know they can't see the forest through the trees, Response. but on this side of the House, we're going to continue making investments that support clean jobs, clean growth, and a low-carbon future for Ontarians. Yeah. Thank you. Stop the clock. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Transportation. The success of the agri-food sector across all of Northern Ontario depends on solid transportation links. Unfortunately, the previous Liberal government ignored the economic importance of the agricultural sector in the North and failed to invest in Ontario's Northern Ontario's uh, transportation network. Communities across the North count on transportation systems that make life easier for people and for our businesses, Speaker. Strong transportation networks are vital for moving goods and to enable economic prosperity and future sustainability for our Northern communities. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain what actions our government is taking to strengthen transportation links for moving goods across our great province? Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you, Speaker. That member works his tail off for the Sioux and asks a very important and great question this morning. Thank you for that. Uh, last week, Speaker, on Wednesday, I announced our government's purchase of four terrific new freight train rail cars for the Ontario Northland Transportation Commission. <laughs> Speaker, let's break that down. Our government is establishing yet another vital transportation link that will connect local farmers to larger markets by transporting their goods by rail throughout Ontario and beyond. This strong investment of over $640,000 bolsters freight train access across the north, which in turn supports economic development opportunities for businesses and communities. 
Speaker, unlike the NDP and the Liberals, our government says yes to building vital transportation so that goods get to market faster Response. and our economy grows. And the supplementary question. Thank you again, uh, Speaker, and thank you again to the Minister for that uh, response. This is encouraging news for farmers and agri-food businesses uh, across Northern Ontario. A strong transportation network also means building and maintaining infrastructure that enables hardworking Ontarians to get across our province by car or transit. That is why it is so vital that our government continues to ensure that investments are being made in northern highways and transit services. I'm very happy and grateful to the Associate Minister and the Minister of Transportation for all the support our community of Sault Ste. Marie has received in connecting links funding. Efficient and convenient transportation networks help to drive economic pr prosperity and improve the overall quality of life for residents in northern communities. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how our government is building strong transportation networks across the north? The Associate Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And the member is right. Infrastructure doesn't build or maintain itself. And after 15 years of Liberal neglect, to be very frank, uh, our system is not where it needs to be. And that requires investment today, Speaker. And that's why our government's getting it done for the transportation needs of the North. In fact, considering that the uh, uh, roads alone, Speaker, this government has dedicated almost $624 million across the 22-23 fiscal year to expand and repair highways and bridges across the entire North. What's more, Speaker, these vital infrastructure upgrades have been supporting more than 4,000 local jobs, all while connecting the North like never before. And, Speaker, of course, let's not forget about the $140 million purchase of three beautiful new train sets for the revamped Northlander passenger rail service that will get people moving from North to South and South to North. Speaker, uh, the NDP supported the Liberals, and the Liberals literally called the North a no-man's land. We disagree. We're getting it done Spons. for the great people of the North and those who call it home. Next question, the member for Mishkigawak, James Bay. Merci, Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Once again, history repeats itself. Another storm, another closing of Highway 11 from Medicine to Long Lac during a 48-hour period. Many accidents, congestion. It's as if the once again the people of the Nord were totally shut down. The government voted against my bill to make oh, highways 11 and 17, give them the same status as the QEW and the 400, and they adopted a motion that had changed absolutely nothing for the people of the North. So my question is the following for the Premier. What do you have to say to people who live near highways 11 and 17 who see continual accidents and who see constant shutting down during the poor state of maintenance of those highways? Thank you, Speaker, and I thank the opposition MPP for the question. First of all, with respect to the shutting down of the highway last week, it's the result of an accident, and the OPP is still inquiring into the causes of the accident. Of course, we will look at the findings of this investigation. Speaker, the people of Northern Ontario know that our government takes uh, the security and safety of our Northern Highways very seriously. Under Premier Ford, we have made huge progress in relation to highway safety in the North was more than ever before than in the history of the province. With respect to the safety and security of Highway 11 and 17, the MPP knows full well that we are broadening Highway 17 right up to the Manitoba border between Thunder Bay, between Manitoba and Nipigon. Thank you. Thunder Bay, Superior North. Speaker, in northwestern Ontario, we experienced another dreadful weekend of carnage on our highways. Two houses were taken out by a transport truck in Beardmore. Tragically, another snowplow driver was killed near Ignis. Highway 17 was closed for a second 12-hour period because two transports crashed into each other, scattering debris all over the highway and killing one of the drivers. Auditor General reports have told us that certain carriers are licensing drivers with next to no training. I heard from an OPP officer this weekend who is afraid to go to work because the highways are unsafe. What is the Premier doing to make sure that all truck drivers are fully trained 
and experienced in winter driving before they are licensed to do cross Canada deliveries. Minister of Transportation. Thank you, Speaker. And um, uh, our, my, my heart's my heart goes out to the uh, the family of the victim this week this weekend in that terrible crash. I can assure the member opposite, as well as all members of this house, that our government takes truck driver safety uh, and training very seriously. Ontario has the most robust commercial licensing system anywhere in Canada, but that doesn't mean that it's enough. We are continuing to review our, our commercial licensing process to make sure that we are strengthening regulations, to make sure our truck drivers have the training they need when they get on the, out, out on the road for themselves as well as for all drivers on Ontario's roads. Just in January, electronic logging devices became uh, required on Ontario roads, and that is something that Ontario was leading the, the Federation in making sure that Ontario trucks are equipped with electronic logging devices. But, Mr. Speaker, Response. we're doing more than just working on truck driver training. We're ensuring that our roads themselves are made safer. Our government is piloting, piloting for the first time in North America a two-plus-one model, which is an innovative model that is, that's been used in, uh, in Scandinavia to make sure that our roads are safe. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. And, Speaker, I hope the Minister can help me understand something. So, why is it that a group of orthopedic surgeons who work at the Ottawa Hospital in my riding had to form a private company in order to rent operating rooms at the hospital they work in and then hire a private company to get surgical instruments and then hire nurses off book. All this just to address the surgical backlog that exists in the hospital they already work in. So can the minister explain why all this jumping through hoops instead of the Ottawa hospital using the capacity that already exists within it? The Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. So, of course, um, since the pandemic began over two and a half years ago, we've actually had a surgical backlog recovery program of almost a billion dollars. And that has been available to organizations such as the Ottawa Hospital and other publicly funded hospitals, and they've been able to utilize it very well. They, they submit their program on how they can use existing uh, OR capacity with their uh, health human resources and it has in fact helped us a great deal uh, we are in fact and and perhaps i haven't said this uh, enough that we're actually back at pre-pandemic wait times now having said that some of those wait times are still 12 months plus six to 12 months so we can do better and we will do better and because of bill 60 Response. we have a process that ensures that individuals, organizations, hospital partnerships can be formed and have that surgical recovery, surgical options available closer in community. Thank you, Speaker. The supplementary question. I'm not sure I heard an answer in that. So maybe here's the answer. Yesterday, the Deputy Minister of Health revealed that the $300 million earmarked for the surgical backlog had not been fully used. Or maybe it's because Ontario has the lowest paid nurses in all of Canada. Or maybe it's because Bill 124 incentivized nurses and other healthcare professionals to leave our hospitals and go and work for private companies. Speak of those operating rooms I spoke about, they, they've been dark on weekends for months, actually probably years. How, how can that be? With all this government has to say about what they're doing, how can that be? Speaker, in hospitals across this province, there are operating rooms that are dark, simply because our hospitals don't have the resources to use them to their full capacity. And the minister knows this. Speaker, through Question. you, can the minister tell us just how it is that we are not using operating rooms in our hospitals to their full capacity? Minister of Health. No, the, the member opposite highlights exactly why we have brought forward Bill 60 and why we are expanding the, com the community surgical and diagnostic piece. We have had 
since the beginning of the pandemic, a fund available to our publicly funded hospitals of almost a billion dollars. And yes, the member opposite is right. In the last fiscal, they have not been able to utilize that full 300 million that was assigned in the last fiscal. But does it not speak to the fact that this is why we need more innovation, this is why we need more opportunities in community to ensure that where there is capacity, where there are wait times that are unacceptable to all of us that we can make sure that we have a process and oversight uh, piece that Response. ensures people get access to surgeries faster. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Energy. Recently, I had the pleasure of joining the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Energy along with some fellow MPPs to tour the Bruce Power nuclear facility. We were able to see firsthand this outstanding operation in action as hardworking members of Ontario's energy sector operate one of the world's largest nuclear plants. Speaker, nuclear energy is safe, clean, reliable, and affordable. Bruce Power operations support 22,000 direct and indirect jobs annually, and their workers are highly skilled, highly educated, and very proud of the work that they do. The PA and I were able to see the command center. And speaker, it was a sight like something out of a Star Trek movie. Wow. And we were also able to see some, some women in nuclear. And I know that the PA and the Minister of Women's Economic and Social Opportunity recently held a roundtable to empower more women to enter this very highly competitive field. Speaker, can the Minister of Energy please provide further information about the important work being done at Bruce Power and throughout Ontario's nuclear industry Question. as a whole? The member for Kitchener South Hesper, Parliamentary Assistant. Member from Mississauga Centre for that great question and for coming with me uh, on our, our trip to Bruce. Your um, enthusiasm matches mine. Nuclear power is uh, emission-free, it's reliable and low cost. Ontario gets about 60% of its power from nuclear. Half of that 60% comes from Bruce Power. The nuclear industry employs over 76,000 people across Canada, but most of those jobs and those people are located right here in Ontario. Our province is rapidly becoming a world leader in nuclear innovation. We're leading the charge on the development and deployment of new technologies like small modular reactors, or SMRs for short. We're building Canada's first grid-scale SMR at Darlington. Up at Bruce, they're setting the gold standard on major component refurbishment to keep the fleet in tip-top shape for years to come. Ontario's economy is certainly growing on nuclear. Thank you. Yeah. The supplementary. Thank you to the PA for that response. It's great to hear that Ontario's nuclear industry is delivering clear, clean and affordable electricity. As a nurse, I am particularly interested in how materials used for nuclear power production can also be used to treat cancer and sterilize medical equipment. The use of nuclear medical isotopes like cobalt-60, lutetium-177 or uretrium-90 can be used for treatment uh, of cancer as well as equipment sterilization and is a vital resource to our healthcare system in our province. While other sterilization methods can take up to seven days before products are available for use, nuclear irradiation can process such materials within one single day. That is why it is critical that Ontario use our nuclear resources and become a leader in exporting medical isotopes around the world. Speaker, can Question. the PA please elaborate on how our government is expanding Ontario's medical isotopes production? Member for Kitchener South Hospital. Thank you uh, for the follow-up, and I'm, I'm so appreciative of the unique insights that's brought by the uh, member from Mississauga Centre as a currently practicing nurse. Um, as we saw on our tour, Ontario's medical isotope programs don't just benefit Ontario, they benefit the entire world. The isotope cobalt-60 is used to sterilize almost 40 per cent of the world's single-use medical devices, so syringes, instruments, implants, gloves. Where does that cobalt-60 come from? Well, fully half of the world's supply comes from our very own CANDU reactors at Bruce and Pickering. And it doesn't stop there. Darlington will be the only North American producer of molybdenum-99, an isotope which is used in over 40 million imaging procedures worldwide. Bruce has just begun commercial production of lutetium-177, which is an isotope used successfully to fight neuroendocrine tumors Response. and prostate cancer. Ontario's nuclear program doesn't just put us on the forefront of clean energy, but as a world leader in life-saving medical isotopes. Thank you. 
Thank you. Next question, the member for Toronto St. Paul's. Thank you, Speaker. This question is to the Premier. Uh, today is the International Day for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. To eliminate racism means cutting it off at the source through anti-racism education. Yet across Ontario, only 49 per cent of public schools have implemented a school-wide anti-racism policy, according to a report by People for Education in my riding of St. Paul's. This is a direct result, Speaker, of Conservative government underspending on public education—$844 million and counting, to be exact. My question to the Premier, will Thursday's budget include the necessary funds so that 100 per cent of Ontario schools can implement anti-racism policies and practices to end racial discrimination experienced by both students and staff? Thank you. To respond, the Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. In every single budget brought forth before this House, funding has been increased in public education. In fact, this year alone, compared to last year, it is up $683 million. And yet the opposition, New Democrats, Liberals, Coalesce came together to oppose that investment, that increase of support. More staff, 7,000 more education workers, they voted against that. 200 more principals, New Democrats voted against that. An additional 800 educators in the classroom adding value, helping kids get back on track on reading, writing and math, they voted against that too. Mr. Speaker, this government is increasing investment. And with respect to anti-racism, we took action to de-stream the entire grade nine curriculum, to remove barriers to great pathways, and to give 100, yes, 100 per cent of children their full potential to succeed in this economy, Mr. Speaker. And the supplementary question. When this Conservative government funds education below inflation, it is a cut, a cut. A recent school year report from the TDSB found that across the TDSB, 50 per cent of hate incidents were race-related. 61 per cent of these were anti-black racism. Black students need to feel safe, safe from violence in all aspects of their lives, especially at school. They deserve for school to be a place of joy, building self-esteem and support. The toll racism takes on their academics and well-being is mounting as schools are increasingly underfunded and understaffed. TDSB is projecting a $61 million shortfall and a loss of 522 staff positions in the coming school year because of this Conservative government's question. Cuts. My question is to the Premier. Will you prevent this from happening? Will your Thursday budget invest every dollar and cent needed to ensure students and staff have the resources necessary in their school to protect them from anti-black racism and hate across the board? Thank you. Mr. Education. Mr. Speaker, in TDSB alone, where the member opposite represents, funding is up $38 million relative to 2017 the Liberals are in power, yet enrollment is down 16,000 students. Even still, funding is up. Now, with respect Order. to the question on empty racism, we take that seriously. I find it ironic, though, that when the members opposite could have supported what the research clearly states, the educator that better reflects the classroom helps improve graduation rates, we abolish Reg 27 for because we believe in a meritocracy of hiring the best educator, not seniority, as supported by the opposition, ideologically Order. blind to the research, which is clear. Let's put an educator that reflects the classroom. Let's find someone who is highly talented, who's racialized, who reflects the experiences of often diverse diasporas Response. in this community and in this province. We're going to stand up for those kids and ensure they get a job, they graduate, they own a home, and they achieve their potential in this country. Well, Stop the clock. Seat. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Kingston and the Islands. Mr. Speaker, a deceased man's CPP survivor's pension is taxed at 50 per cent before it can help his disabled widow. Linda McGuinness is my constituent and she needs help. She's on ODSP, but $400 a month of that is clawed back because of an $800 a month CPP survivor's pension provided by her late 
husband. So she ends up with a monthly income of $1,400, which is pretty much used up by shelter costs of $1,000 a month and $300 a month for utilities in winter. She's been overlooked by this government's stingy approach to ODSP in the face of rising costs of living. Would the government extend the $1,000 threshold for earned income clawbacks to CPP survivors' pensions? I, on behalf of the government, the government house leader. I, 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 I'll speak a bit personally to this. Uh, you know, my uh, my father died when I was quite young, and my family relied on uh, on survivor benefits for a number of years. But you know what helped us out a lot too, Mr. Speaker. Uh, is when there was a government in place that actually looked after the things that were important to us, right? When costs went down so that our family could afford to do things that, uh, that we otherwise couldn't have. We lived through that high inflation period that was in the, 19, in the 1980s, that high inflation period of the late 80s, Mr. Speaker. So what we're trying to do is build an Ontario that reflects the needs of the people of the province of Ontario. Whether you're young, whether you're old, Ontario should be what it used to be. The place where you can grow and have a family, where you can afford to live, where you have a home for you, where that senior doesn't have to worry about the high price to hydro, in, in essence created by the Liberals, by the party that he actually represents, Mr. Speaker. We have turned the table on all of that. We've increased ODSP rates in the province of Ontario. We've cut taxes and eliminated them for the lowest income earning people in the province of Ontario. We're giving people a hand up because that's what Ontario Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, the government uh, must stop dragging its feet on the mental health and addictions crisis. Linda McGuinness, the same constituent, her shelter situation is enormously impacted by this. She has the burden of living three houses away from Kingston's Integrated Care Hub. That's a consumption treatment centre with health care and social services. It anchors a community of people struggling with addictions. Unfortunately, the neighbourhood is also beset by drug dealing, and petty theft. To change this, municipalities need province-wide, predictable, and sustained funding for supportive housing where treatments can be followed. While we wait, Linda McGuinness is stuck. She can't afford to move. She can't afford to sell her house at a vastly depressed price. Will the government's budget, Question. Speaker, will the government's budget respond to this crisis and address Linda McGuinness's dilemma? And the government has seen it. Speaker, how, how does any member of the opposition get up and ask a question like that when they have voted against every single measure that we have brought forward to make housing more affordable in the province of Ontario? We have sat here for months. While this government has said that Order. we needed to bring more housing online to make housing more affordable, they have opposed every single measure, transit-oriented communities, They've opposed it. We reduce taxes. They oppose it. We focus on low-income earners, take them off the tax rolls. They oppose it, Mr. Speaker. Today in this House, we have the Minister of, in of Infrastructure's father. Here's a person who came to this country, fled a communist dictatorship to build a better life for him and his family. It wasn't easy, but they came here. You know why? Because there was hope. There was opportunity. You had opportunity to grow and Boss. prosper. He has the opportunity to, to sit here and watch his daughter serve in one of the largest governments in North America while we prosper, Mr. Speaker. So I beg the opposition, get on board, help us build a bigger, better, stronger Ontario. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Thank you. Restart the clock. The next question, the member for Flamborough, Glanbrook. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. All children and youth deserve to live happy, healthy, and fulfilling lives. However, the reality is that children and youth living with complex health and special needs, along with their families, encounter extraordinary challenges in their daily lives and in accessing the care and the services that they require. While our government has made significant investments for early intervention and has implemented a range of programs to support children and youth, more must be done to make it easier for families to navigate the system. Access to health care and social services should be seamless, coordinated, Order. and designed to address the individual and unique circumstances of children and their families. Speaker, will the minister please describe what action our government is taking 
to expand access to services for children and youth with Question. complex needs. Mr. Children, Community and Social Services. Order. There's nothing showing up here. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker, and thanks to the member from Flamborough, Glenn Burke, for the, the question. Uh, she's absolutely right. Uh, investments to support children with special needs are important, and so is the innovation and trying new things that will help create programs for the future and for, and for the need for now. That's why I was happy to launch a new pilot program last week, the Integrated Pathway to Children and Youth with Extensive Needs program, which co will connect children and youth with complex special needs to the care that they need. They and their families will connect to a team of professionals, including physicians, social workers, and behavioral consultants who work together to provide a tailored approach based on the individual needs of the child or youth and their families. We are investing Fox. in creative and innovative solutions that will improve the lives and outcomes of our most vulnerable children and their families. Supplementary question. Speaker, and back to the Minister. It's important to recognize that our government is finding solutions that are flexible enough to meet the needs of families when it comes to addressing the struggles that they experience every single day. There are many children and youth in Ontario with complex needs such as developmental, mental health, and medical concerns. Their needs, along with the needs of their families, can only be met through an integrated approach. This program announcement is a step in the right direction but it is vital that the care and services provided by hospitals and local community agencies ensures that our most vulnerable are not left behind. Speaker, will the minister please explain how the integrated pathway for children and youth with extensive needs supports children in our province? Services can include adjusting medications, personalized behavior support plans, mental health assessments and treatment, social work such as counseling for parents and caregivers, and specialized interventions to support children and youth to build skills such as communication and self-regulation. Starting in April 2023, this program will be offered at McMaster Children's Hospital in Hamilton, Holland Bloorview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital in Toronto, and the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario in Ottawa and the surrounding regions. This exciting new pilot complements our investments to build service capacity and simplify early intervention through children's treatment centres in Surrey Place. Together with my colleague, the Minister of Health, our government knew that the status quo was not working, and programs like this innovative, integrated pathway will help to ensure children with complex special needs get the care that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for University Rosedale. Thank you. Uh, my question is to the Premier. Premier, last year you promised to crack down on developers who cancel or jack up the price of pre-construction homes. There are five people at Queen's Park today who listened very carefully to that promise. In 2022, Briarwood Development Group told these families they could either take their deposit back or pay up to $175,000 more for their home than they originally agreed to in the original contract. It's been nearly a year since then, and these families are still waiting for justice. Their homes are not built, the developer has not been fined, their licence has not been suspended. Premier, are you going to keep your word and protect home buyers from bad actor developers like Consumer these? Protection. Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Speaker, under Premier Ford, this government vowed to stop bad developers from trying to make extra money off the backs of hardworking Ontarians, which is why we announced new changes that Order. strengthen the regulatory tools available to address this serious issue. Speaker, these changes include doubling the maximum fine for unethical builders who unfairly cancel contracts. Under these new changes, bad developers could now be on the hook of hundreds of thousands of dollars in fines for each infraction. Speaker, we have heard stories, unfortunately, that the individuals, the, the builders who have cancelled the pro projects or have ripped off an uh, individuals, and that's why Premier Ford has said this is unacceptable. This type of appalling behaviour will not be tolerated by this government. Thank you. 
Order. The supplementary question. Thank you. Minister, if, if it is not tolerated by this government, then why are these people still waiting for their homes to be built at the price that they originally agreed to? These families are proof that this government does not adequately protect homeowners from bad developers who cancel or jack up the price of pre-construction homes. What is this to the minister? What concrete next steps are you going to take to ensure these home buyers get the homes they were promised at the price they originally agreed to? Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the, the question. Speaker, it is this government that is doubling the maximum fine for unethical builders who unfairly cancel contracts. Speaker, it is this government that is providing Order. money from these penalties straight to the victims for the very first time in the history of this province. Speaker, it is this Order. government that is putting bad builders who rip off Ontarians' homeowners can have their license permanently suspended. Speaker, it is this government that Windsor is empowering West, our board. courts by doubling the maximum financial penalties for repeat offenders of the new Home Construction Licensing Act. Speaker, we understand hardworking Ontarians can rest assured that this government have their backs. We won't rest until Response. that message is heard loud and clear across the province. Thank you. Order. The next question, the member for Mississauga, Erin Mills. Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Housing. For too many Ontarians, it remains a major challenge to find the right home. Recent reports reveal that Mississauga is one of the most expensive cities to live in Canada, with the average housing price remaining close to $1, uh, $1 million. Affordability and the housing shortage are serious concerns for the people in my riding of Mississauga Erin Mills, and this is a problem impacting other regions across our province. Ontarians are counting on our government to support them in achieving their dream of home ownership. We must continue our robust efforts to build more homes faster and tackle the housing crisis. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain what our government is doing to Question. create the conditions necessary for building more affordable housing across our province? Excellent question. The Associate Minister of Housing. Well, thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I want to thank my honourable colleague from uh, Mississauga, Aaron Mills, for the question and also for the great work that he does on behalf of his constituents every single day. So, Speaker, a few months ago, I, I toured Z Modular, which is a factory in Kitchener, Ontario, that pre built modular housing units right here in our province, Mr. Speaker. They manufacture shipping container style boxes, which you can customize or stack to build modular homes, Mr. Speaker. You can pick the layout and materials you want included and have it delivered to your property with 90% of the project completed off-site, which, Mr. Speaker, would result in 50% faster project completion. And thanks to the member from Hastings, Lennox and Addington, I also had the opportunity to meet the GPS 3D modular, Mr. Speaker, who uses a green precast uh, concrete Response. modular system to build up to 10 stories high, Mr. Speaker. These are innovative solutions. These are the ones that's going to help us get out of the supply of the housing. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for that response. It is a good news that our government is actively engaging with companies that provide innovative solutions to address the housing crisis. As global inflation continues to impact the costs of living for Ontarians, we are also seeing the rise in recent prices, uh, in rent prices in our province. Housing experts continue to anticipate that the cost of rent could continue to rise in the coming months. For example, in Mississauga, it costs over $2,000 per month for a rent, a one-bedroom unit. Our government must take urgent action now to increase the availability of rental units in order for the hard-working individuals and families in Ontario to have a place to live. Speaker, Question. can the Associate Minister please explain how our government is increasing the options for affordable rental housing? 
Associate Minister of Housing. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And I also want to congratulate uh, the member on his recent appointment as parliamentary assistant, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of Public and Business Service Delivery, Mr. Speaker. Now, while on, uh, while on tour, Mr. Speaker, at the Z-Modular facility, they explained to me how they not only create detached housing, but they can also scale up projects to create buildings for residential use. Mr. Speaker, they're currently working on projects in Lucan, Ontario, St. Clair College, and Port Elgin, and they're working on affordable housing projects all over the province, Mr. Speaker. Z-Modular and GPS 3D Modular are using modern technology and manufacturing processes similar to what the Ford Motor Company did in the early 1900s, Mr. Speaker, to make it more affordable to purchase a vehicle, but now to make it more affordable to buy homes, Mr. Speaker. These are great solutions that will help us alleviate Response. some of our housing crisis issues. I hope the opposition supports us as we go forward, as we try to tackle the housing the next question, the member for Ottawa West Nepean. Thank you, Speaker. While our children struggle to catch up, their mental health is in crisis, and violence is increasing in our schools, this government is underfunding education by stealth. They've committed $6 billion less than what we actually need to fund schools, and they're not even getting promised funding out the door. Now the Toronto District School Board will have to cut 522 staff members, while the Ottawa Carleton School Board is looking at cuts of up to $39 million. Parents, school boards, principals, teachers and education workers are calling for more funding. Will the government listen to them so that our children get the support they deserve in Thursday's budget? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for the question. I can absolutely confirm that we are going to continue to increase investment in public education in this budget, in every budget, because that's been the track record of our Progressive Conservative Party. $650 million more million this school year alone. With respect to TDSB, the member opposite cited that question, they are up in funding $38 million, notwithstanding a significant decline in children in their schools. 16,000 kids are not in schools. Now, the members opposite are urging the government to continue a fund they oppose. The irony is not lost on progressive conservatives. But yes, we will continue to increase investment, increase resources and staffing to help these kids get back on track. We also will continue to make the case that children should be in school without disruption right to June. And I hope the members opposite will agree. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. Pleased to inform the House that we have a former member with us in the House this morning. Um, the member for Barrie in the 40th Parliament, Rod Jackson. Welcome back to Queen's Park. Great to see you. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Ottawa Centre has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Health concerning delays facing cancer patients at the Ottawa Hospital. This matter will be debated today following private members' public business. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Ottawa South has given notice of his dissatisfaction with the answer to his question given by the Minister of Health concerning operating rooms. This matter will be debated today following private members' public business. I understand the member for Scarborough Aging Court has a point of voice. Earlier today, when I introduced the CARDAS delegation, unfortunately, I omitted the name of one more person, a uh, religious leader, uh, and his name is very reverend Vartan Tashjan. The CARDAS delegation will be in room 228 to meet members of the various political parties and representatives to dialogue with them. Thank you very much. I understand the Social Minister of Housing has a point. Thank you very much, Speaker. To take this opportunity to wish all those who are celebrating Nowruz a happy hey. new year, Mr. Speaker. This is a, a very, very difficult time for the members of the Iranian community here and, of course, in Iran as they continue to fight for freedom and democracy against a brutal regime. I thank all my colleagues and the entire cross here across from me for all the love and support that they've shown to our members of our community. They truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
understand the member for Hamilton Mountain has a point. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I would like to uh, welcome Paige Artur uh, Cordovani's uh, family, who is here uh, today. We have Lija, Danielle, and Vachante Cordovani. Uh, they're the parents of our Paige uh, from Hamilton Centre. Welcome to Queen's Park. From Mississauga, Aaron Mills apparently has a point for Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just missed to welcome my friend Rabia Luz, who is joining today the Cardas uh, seminar, and uh, I uh, welcome in Queen's Park. Thank you. Thank you. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m.